this announcement coming from the U.S. President from the State Department that the U.S. is announcing that they're desig designating the Iran's Islamic uh, Revolutionary Guards as a terror organization, as a terrorist organization. What are the implications of that? Well, it's unprecedented, Robin, no, it to actually Perfect. say a uh, part of a state is a foreign terrorist yeah. organization. So the implications are kind of hard to know. It's something we're going to work out as the weeks and months ahead move. On paper, mm -hmm. it means that there are significantly more measures the U.S. can take against anybody considered to have given tangible or intangible assistance uh, to the IRGC. Anywhere in the world, they can be prosecuted on U.S. soil or have proceedings brought against them. So it enormously increases the toolbox for US prosecutors or defense officials potentially if they choose to make moves against the IRGC but I have to say because it's never happened before we don't really quite know how practically it will be applied the point is though it's the very hard talk we're hearing from the Trump administration against Iran the Obama administration as you know hatched a very complicated but it's apparently successful up to a most point nuclear deal with them uh, Trump kicked that aside and said he wanted a much tougher approach they've moved in many different areas this is the most serious move so okay. far against the Nick, most and I'm going to interrupt you there in terms uh, Nick I'm going to interrupt you I'm going to go straight to the State Department to hear more on this decision here's Mike this Pompeo is the first time that the United States has designated a part of another government as an FTO we're doing it because the Iranian regime's use of terrorism as a tool of statecraft makes it fundamentally different from any other government this historic step will divide the world's leading state sponsor of terror the financial means to spread misery and death around the world Businesses and banks around the world now have a clearer duty to ensure that companies with which they conduct financial transactions are not connected to the IRGC in any material way. It also gives the U.S. government additional tools to counter Iranian-backed terrorism. This designation is a direct response to an outlaw regime and should surprise no one. And it builds on the more than 970 Iranian individuals and entities that the Trump administration has already sanctioned. For 40 years, the Islamic Republic's Revolutionary Guard Corps has actively engaged in terrorism and created, supported, and directed other terrorist groups. The IRGC masquerades as a legitimate military organization, but none of us should be fooled. It regularly violates the laws of armed conflict. It plans, organizes, and executes terror campaigns all around the world. From the moment it was founded, the IRGC's mandate was to defend and export the regime's revolution by whatever means possible. The IRGC institutionalized terrorism shortly after its inception, directing horrific attacks against the Marine barracks in Beirut in 1983 and the U.S. Embassy Annex in 1984. Alongside the terror group it midwifed, Lebanese Hezbollah. Its operatives have worked to destabilize the Middle East from Iraq to Lebanon to Syria and to Yemen. With this designation, the Trump administration is simply recognizing a basic reality. The IRGC will take its rightful place on the same list as terror groups it supports. Lebanese Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Hamas, Khatib Hezbollah, among others, all of which are already designated as foreign terrorist organizations. The long list of IRGC-backed terror incidents is ample justification for today's decision. I want to just give you a handful of examples. Last September, a federal court in the United States found Iran and the IRGC responsible for the 1996 Kobar Towers bombing, bombing, which killed 19 American service members. In 2011, the United States foiled an IRGC could for its plus right here in Washington, D.C. to bomb a restaurant. The attempt was to kill the Saudi ambassador to the United States of America. Outside of the United States, the IRGC's terror campaign is just as active. In 2012, four Quds Force operatives were apprehended after plotting to attack Israeli targets in Turkey. In that same year, two other Quds Force operatives were arrested in Kenya for planning a bomb attack, while the Quds Force also directed a bomb attack that targeted Israeli diplomats. And as recently as January 2018, German authorities uncovered 10 suspected Quds Force operatives active in their country. The IRGC supports Palestinian terror groups that target in the civilians, and it helped create U.S.-designated terror groups both in Lebanon and in Iraq. And the IRGC also backs the murderous Assad regime, which gasses and slaughters its own people. 
Our designation makes clear to the world that the Iranian regime not only supports terrorist group, but engages in terrorism itself. This designation also brings unprecedented pressure on figures who lead the, the regime's terror campaign, individuals like Qasem Soleimani. He's the commander of the Quds Force and oversees Iran's forces deployed to advance <clears throat> the Islamic Revolution through terrorism and other forms of violence. He doles out the regime's profits to terrorist groups across the region and around the world. The blood of the 603 American soldiers the Iranian regime as founder of killed in Iraq is on his hands and on the hands of the IRGC more broadly. Inexplicably, the regime has faced no accountability from the international community for those deaths. Far from being an arbitrary attack on Iran, our pressure campaign imposes just and long overdue consequences for the regime's malign activity. We should not also forget the RGC's central role in the nationwide con artistry and corruption of the regime's leaders, which they perpetrate against the regime's own people. Other governments and the private sector will now see more clearly how deeply the IRGC has enmeshed itself in the Iranian economy through both licit and illicit means. In just this past July, the City Council of Tehran announced that the IRGC Cooperative Foundation, which manages the IRGC's investments, has embezzled more than $1 billion from the city of Tehran. The next month, a former council member accused the longtime mayor of, of Tehran of steering contracts to the IRGC. It's no coincidence that the mayor also formally served as an IRGC commander and the chief of Iran's police state. Back in 2017, Tehran arrested several IRGC commanders involved with the Cooperative Fund for Corruption, including the IRGC's financial architect, Masoud Merdadi. Then there's Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's old college pal, Sadiq Mousili. They call him the billionaire general. He went from being a low-level IRGC officer to one of Iran's richest men, all thanks to scoring construction and oil contracts from companies linked to the IRGC. The leaders of Iran are racketeers, not revolutionaries. The Iranian people deserve better than to be governed by this cadre of hypocritical and corrupt officials. They're opportunists. And on a final note, the IRGC is also responsible for wrongly detaining U.S. persons, several of whom remain in captivity in Iran. The American people should know that we are working diligently to bring each of those individuals home. With this designation, we are sending a clear signal, a clear message to Iran's leaders, including Qasem Soleimani and his band of thugs, that the United States is bringing all pressure to bear to stop the regime's outlaw behavior. We ask that our allies and partners around the world do the same. Thank you. What do you think the reaction will be and the possible suggestion by some of the reporters there? You heard the questions that there might be some sort of retaliation. Well, I think no doubt that there will be some sort of retaliation. One of the things, uh, Robin, that the Iranians have already said that they want to do, and this is coming from uh, the Iranian parliament, they say that they themselves are now going to, or now want to, uh, declare the U.S. and its presence in the Middle East uh, as a terrorist organization as well, or at least the U.S. military. So that in itself, obviously, could be a risk, could be a threat uh, to the United States presence in the Middle East. And it's quite interesting, uh, Robin, because over the past, especially the last couple of times that I've been in Iran, I have been able to speak to some members of the Revolutionary Guard and also to the head of the Revolutionary Guard. And they said, look, uh, if the United States does something like this, uh, then they believe that the U.S. in the Middle East is quite vulnerable. One of the things uh, that one um, former Revolutionary Guard officer said to me is, look, the U.S. has so many bases in the Middle East, all of those could become targets for the Revolutionary Guard. And then you've already had very strong reactions already coming from Iran's foreign minister, uh, Jawad Zarif, uh, condemning this even before the announcement was made. You actually had the head of the Revolutionary Guard come out yesterday and say that this would be a big security risk for the United States and that U.S. troops in the Middle East would now also be a target of the Iranians if, in fact, the Revolutionary Guard were declared a, a terrorist organization. We have to keep in mind this is not just a large military part of the uh, of the Iranian military. It's not just their elite military organization, but they also have deep, deep economic ties and economic power and political power inside Iran. So certainly this is a giant step in a very, very powerful organization uh, that the U.S. has now uh, declared a terrorist organization, certainly one uh, that has announced that there will be some form of retaliation, Robin.